have enjoyed yourself, and I hope there's not an endurance tonight uh, to hear me and all these other preachers that's been here this week to preach. And Brother Mays asked me if I'd preach. And well, now that's my business. Amen. I'm yes. a preacher. Yes, sir. I'm not a minister. I'm a preacher. That's yes. right. A lot of folks, you know, they're always looking for a, a mixer. One woman told me some time back, said, we don't have much of a preacher, but said, we've got a wonderful mixer. <laughs> well, I said, uh, you can get them to Sears Roebuck. Bless God, I'm a mixer, but I'm looking for somebody to preach when I'm born to preach. I think about all the preach like the house is on fire, hell's the front yard, and the devil's a climb in the back window. Amen. I think ought to get excited about what he's preaching about. Amen. I heard a little fellow say one time years ago, he said, if a man uh, is up preaching, he said, I want him to make me think he believes what he's preaching, whether he does or not. Yes, sir. I do want to get excited about this thing of living for God Almighty. There's nothing more thrilling in all this world than to serve God and live for Jesus right. Christ. But I never had anything that would stir me like living for God Almighty. Bless God, I'll tell you right now, the devil can bribe me, can stomp you down, and you can feel like that the world came it in, and the sun will never shine, the storms will come upon you forever, and about that time, God will come tiptoeing across the back porch of your soul, and the next thing you know, you're done on cloud nine, hollering hallelujah, hallelujah, because there's nothing like living for Jesus Christ. And brother, I'll tell you right now, outside of soul salvation, there's nothing to you anymore than to see somebody else say but God's wonderful, amazing right. grace. Now, I want to say something tonight. This don't sound too important to a lot of folks. And they'll sit back and guide one another and giggle and uh, whack on their chewing gum. Some go to sleep. Some never pay no attention. I'll tell you folks, listen, find out the direct will of God for your life. Amen. I mean, find out the direct will of God. Not the permissive will of God, but the direct will of God. I want to say if you find out, you young people tonight, if you find out the direct will of God in your early life and begin to practice what God wants you to do, you can, you can head off a many of a heartache that will come your way. I mean, you live in the right community if you know the direct will of God. I mean, you'll marry the right person. <laughs> Some of you done said right now, I done missed that. Amen. Well, brother, I'll tell you, you'll, you'll marry the right I mean, you'll have the right kind of a job. I mean, you'll have the right church. You'll go to the right church. And you won't have to swap every 30 days and be known as a Trump Christian. Amen. That's right. A lot of people, they're buzzard Christians. That's what they are. Only time you ever see them when a funeral takes place or a stinks up. Huh? That's right. That's the only time you ever see a buzzard. You didn't look for a buzzard if they brought something dead around. And you let somebody die, here they come. They have been in church in six months, but they'll come a sailing in. Amen. Or you let a stink get up to fix to run the preacher off or get rid of the uh, some deacon. Man, they can smell a stink for 400 miles. I, I, I don't know. God must have fixed it in a buzzard somehow to pick up a stinking thing. I, I mean, he just smell a stink. They did something about it. I come by a hog pen one day, and it looked to me like there's a hundred buzzards is roosting in that hog pen. Wasn't well, nothing to eat around there, but it sure smelled good to them, I reckon. They was all sitting up there in the tree, uh, smelling that old stinking hog pen, and it had deceived them. They'd come in from all over that portion around Meridian, Mississippi, and there's a lot of old buzzards down there. <laughs> Amen. When you get the mind of God, you find out that the righteousness of God, the holiness of God, and the purity of God Almighty was right. In spite of mom and daddy, young and everybody else, you say amen to the truth of God Almighty. That's in the book. You say, I can't swallow that. We'll choke on it. Amen. So anyhow, bless God, whether you believe it or don't believe it, that's right. I'll tell you what to do. A lot of people up and down the country, they're looking for a little mealy mouth, back scratching, compromising, ear tickling, pussy footing, mud hole wallet, cigarette sucking, poodle dog carrying preacher. They get up and talk to salt. They sound like he's got a bunion on his tongue and a hernia on his lung. I never get excited. That's right. I was going to meet the other day, and, and a fella got up and, and stomped out because I said something about the lodge hall. I got to holler, goodbye, 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 amen. Holly is a leave it out. And I said, bless God, does anybody else want to go? Leave $10 so we can fumigate where you're sitting. Amen. And the rest of you can leave. Now listen, friend. I'll tell you, find out the will of God for your life tonight. You tell a preacher it's a hard thing to know. Well, I'll grant you a lot of times it is a hard thing to know. The direct will of God. Well, I'd get over here in a sinkhole somewhere. I'd get over on the backside of the mountain over here. Go that God on top of the mountain. 
I'd get out in the holler, Lord, I've got the ground hold if I had to. I'd call on God, I'd ring the bell to him till I found out what God wanted me to do in this life, huh? And God will use you. I used to pray when I first got saved, oh, Lord, use me. God used me somewhere. Lord, you, and one day God said, son, why don't you quit praying that prayer? He said, you get usable and I'll use you. <laughs> hey, man, that's just how simple it is, huh? Reason God doesn't use some folks, why, they're not usable. One dear lady came to the El Moody, the famous evangelist, and said, Mr. Moody, I'd give the world to have what you have. And old El Moody looked at her and said, lady, that's exactly what it cost me. Yeah. It cost me the world. And if you're going to have power with God, you're going to have victory with the Lord, find out the direct will of God, and get in the battlefield for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I appreciate the privilege to be here, and I hope that I have something that will be a blessing to you. Now, a lot of times, I told the pastor, when I, uh, uh, Brother Jackson, when I get up to preach, a lot of times I, I just, uh, I really don't know what God wants me to preach. I mean, I'm subject to preach everything in the Bible. I've been known to do that on a few occasions just about. Start in Genesis and, and just preach till it looks like everybody's tired. So I'm going to tell you something. I ain't got nothing to do to serve God. I ain't got another thing to do. Not another thing. And uh, you say you got to go back home. I come up here expecting to go home. Amen. Bless God. I just soon leave Mount Airs anywhere I know of. And uh, you say about your wife and children. They're saved. We'll be there. Praise God. But I want to bring something that I hope will be a blessing to you tonight. The you your Bible, turn to the book of Acts. The book of Acts of the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles tonight as we take a text from the blessed word of God. The Acts of the Apostles begin reading in the 16th chapter. Now, here's a chapter that's thrilling to me, and uh, a lot of folks are kind of mixed up on the thing, I think. Uh, they, they tell you that uh, Paul and Silas were prisoners behind the prison bars. It's true. They are behind the prison bars, but friend, they're free. Amen. I mean, they're free. Oh, you see, yeah, but they're behind the prison bars, and they're, they're, they're prisoners. No, they're free. Did you ever read John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 32, where Jesus said, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Huh? They put you behind the jail bars, no amount there, and they make you a prisoner. Bless God, you're free in the Lord, free in Christ. And uh, the old jailer that uh, talks about here in this uh, portion of God's Word, he was the one that was bound up. He was the prisoner. He was bound in his sins, bound in his trespasses, didn't know God, wasn't looking for God. Uh, alienated from God, damned, doomed, and blinded, to spend eternity in the charred walls of hell. And here's this man, he's sound asleep, but he is a prisoner. He is a prisoner, my friend. He was bound up, and he's on his road to hell. And I want to read the story to you tonight, and bring the message from this portion of God's Word. In verse 25 of chapter 16 of the book of the Acts of the Apostles, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed, and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's fans were loose. And the chief of the prisoner waking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do not self no harm, for we're all here. Then the jailer called for light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, uh, and was baptized, he, uh, and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, uh, he set meat before them, uh, and rejoiced, believing in God, uh, with all his house. And uh, when it was day, uh, the master sent the sergeant, saying, uh, Let those men go. And the keeper of the prisoner, uh, prison told this saying to Paul, The master have sent to let you go. Now, therefore, depart and go in peace. Uh, now, look into the story tonight. Here's Paul and Silas uh, in the calaboose, says, down in the jailhouse. Uh, and, uh, friend, uh, I want to bring you a message tonight. Notice here in verse 26, it says, uh, in the middle of the verse, uh, and immediately the doors were open. 
Now then in verse 27, notice in the middle of the verse, and sin, the prison doors open. I want to talk to you tonight on getting your prison doors open. May we bow our heads in just a moment of prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Heavenly Fathers, we look to you tonight. Thank you for amazing grace. Thank you for that good hour. Hallelujah. When God's love uh, reached down in the mud and by lifted us up uh, and set our feet uh, upon a solid rock. Uh, oh, God, it's never been the same since that day, uh, since Jesus uh, uh, washed our sins away. I'm glad for that good hour uh, when heaven, thank God, uh, moved into our hearts and we became joint heirs uh, with Jesus Christ, uh, the only begotten Son of God. Now, Lord, you know what we need in this hour tonight? I pray that you bless everything that's said and done. Be an honor thy precious name. Thank you for jubilee time. And God's people can come together and rejoice in the blessings of heaven. Now, Lord, I haven't come tonight to entertain, nor to be entertained. But I've come tonight to preach the gospel of our wonderful Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Burn out the sin tonight. Burn out the alloys, the drugs, everything that keep us from living for God. Help us tonight, God, to get on the battlefield and the fire out the direct will of God as the prison bars uh, swing open. Uh, have your precious way in the service tonight, and we give you honor, praise, and glory for it. Save those that are unsaved, uh, go home the backsliders, uh, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name, uh, and his name alone do we pray, amen and amen. Some years ago, I was down in Decatur, Georgia, and it asked me to preach a uh, message that night. And just as I started uh, out of the pulpit, uh, the speaker of the house stepped up and he said, uh, I'd like for uh, a fellow back here by the name of Poor Boy, I believe they call him, to come up and give his testimony. They call him this fella, and a great big tall guy, I guess he is 6'4 or 6'5 inches tall, got up out of his feet. He had a true haircut. He came down, stepped upon the platform and looked down at that crowd and he said, folks, for 30 years I've been known behind the prison bars in the state of Georgia as poor boy. But he said, thank God tonight I'm a, a child of God and I've been saved by the amazing grace of God Almighty. And that man, while he was testifying, I was sitting in the seat behind him. i never seen as many scars upon one man's head in all my life. And that man told how that for 30 long years uh, he'd been behind the prison bars. Uh, but now then, he gave his testimony. How uh, that one night, glory to God, he bowed in the old sail and cried out and asked God to save his soul uh, from a devil's hell. Now that man didn't know what I was going to preach about. Uh, the pastor of the church didn't know what I was going to preach about. But I stepped up. I already had my uh, message uh, and what God had laid on my heart for the hour. And I was to break the message that night. And I preached on getting uh, the prison bars open. And it looked like that God had just illustrated to this crowd that he's still in the prison bar opening business. Amen. He let this fellow out and he had done down uh, through all the years. Uh, now as you come to the text tonight, at the midnight hour, Paul and Silas uh, was in the old jail. Uh, their backs had been beaten. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, trouble, distress was upon them. Uh, and old Paul said at the midnight hour under Silas, uh, he said, Sir, we'll get hospitaled uh, and we're going to sing a little bit and we're going to have a prayer meeting uh, and then we're going to try to get a little rest before morning. Uh, and boy, I'll tell you, old Silas looked around and said, all right. He said, let's sing number 23. Uh, and they got to singing, the Lord's my shepherd. I shall not walk. He lead us be beside the steel waters. Uh, he restored my soul. Uh, boy, listen. Elvis Presley, they have sung the jailhouse rock. Uh, but God is the first of that ever rocked one. Amen. Uh, I want to tell you, it's the midnight hour. That old jail begin to reel. Uh, and to begin the rock. As it did so, the Bible tells how that the prison bars open. God looked down on the scene. And God said, listen, he said, my old boys have been in that jail long enough. I'm going to let them out. Now I'll attend to those prison bars. Bless God. I began to reel and rock and blow the, the doors open. Paul and Silas came walking out. Now, that old jailer was in there, sound asleep. And all of a sudden, he shook out of bed. Uh, amen. I could see as he hit the old floor. And he jumps up. He came running in. The Bible said, trembling. Uh, and he fell down before Paul and Silas. Uh, and he cried out. And he said, sirs, uh, who are I've heard of a 
jailer calling prisoners sirs. Uh, that was just one thing about it. He wanted to get bored again. Amen. He said, sirs, what must I do uh, to be saved? Uh, and they said, join a Camelot church uh, and get baptized uh, and thou shalt be saved. Uh, is that what they said? Uh, no, sir. You can get baptized with a tadpole uh, in the creek and shake hands uh, with all the catfish, honey, and die and go to hell if you don't get washed in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? And I want to tell you, friends, this, uh, they didn't tell you to join some church. Uh, you know, you turn the radio on, you hear some of these fellows, that's all they ever talk about is to get baptized, baptized. And until the way he says it, what he is, uh, right there, uh, he's a water dog. Uh, that's what he is. Uh, he means it, that uh, water is essential to salvation. I'll tell you, friends, this, uh, if I need not save the water, I'd never sing about the blood. I'd never preach about the blood. I'd take every sermon in the Bible out that said anything about the blood. Uh, I have every song out of the book. Uh, they said anything about the blood. I've never said what can wash away my sins. Uh, nothing but the blood. I change that thing. I've said what can wash away my sins. Uh, nothing but the water. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the water. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the water fountain. I never sang at the cross, at the cross, uh, where I first saw the light. I sang at the meal pond. The meal pond where I first got dunked. Amen. I never sang amazing grace. How sweet the sound. I sang amazing baptism. How sweet the splash. Honey, I'm not saved by water. I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Thank God. Now, somebody said, Well, preacher, I went there. That's awful. They should say things about denominations and about churches, honey. Bless God, it's reason I don't belong to the ministerial assassination. Amen. God, I'm fed up with all this hell raising in churches up and down the country. False doctrine. A bunch of liars in the pulpits. Listen, friend, I'll tell you tonight that ain't telling them to get baptized. Now, tell you another thing. They didn't tell him to join the Jehovah's uh, false witnesses either. The 144,000. Some fellow came to me the other day and he said, those Jehovah's Witness, he said they used to be known as Russellites. Uh, then they became known as the Watchtower Society. And now they're the Jehovah's Witness. He said, can you tell me why did they change their name so much? Uh, I said, they're all crooks. Uh, alias Joe, alias John. If I didn't believe in a burning hell, I'd change my name. If I didn't believe in heaven, like the Bible teaches it, I'd change my name. If I didn't believe my friends, uh, uh, what the Bible says, concerning the Godhead that is a trinity and so on and so forth, I change my name. Have I had a certain one? I'll tell you, I'll tell you, friends, they didn't tell them to get the, uh, into the 144,000. I heard this fellow Garner Ted Armstrong some time back. He said there's no such thing as a burning hell. He said it's an old English word spelled H-E-L. And he said there's no such thing as a burning hell. He said it's an old English word which means a a dark hole in the ground. Now he said when we was boys, he said we used to dig the potatoes. And he said my daddy and my grandpa would have us to put the potatoes in the dark hole in the ground in hell. I thought, yeah, God stick you in hell. You'll come out of faith, Peter. Amen. I want to tell you one thing right now, honey. Listen, the Bible said it's a place where the worm dies not. And the fire's not quits, huh? That's exactly what it says. Now listen, they didn't tell him to join up the 144,000, the Jehovah's Witness. Uh, they didn't tell him, my friends, to go down and join up with the Whiscopalians. Uh, that's right, the Episcopalians. I call them Whiscopalians. Uh, in 1955, when they voted it was all right for the clergyman to drink liquor, they've been Whiscopalians to me ever since then. Uh, you say, that's a rubbing me wrong. Well, turn around, Miss Scott, and I'll rub you a few strokes in the other direction. That's right. Listen, friend, uh, I want to tell you one thing right now. Best doctor, that is telling to join up out of the Methodists, the Presbyterians, uh, not even the Baptists. Uh, some years ago, I had an old great grandma. She went out west, out to the state of Texas. Uh, and while she's out there, she came in contact uh, with that damnable doctrine uh, that the Christian scientist puts out. And she said, there's no such thing as pain. Uh, yes, sir. I heard that junk all my life. They had verses over there in Ezekiel chapter, what, 
Mark 6 and verse 16, uh, if you cut yourself, you can quote scripture and walk around the closet and quote scripture to yourself. And it stopped people from believing and all of that. And that's old Christian scientist doctrine and all of that. But anyhow, uh, they had everybody in the mountains back there where I believe and believe that. Bless God, I got you for you. Cut your leg off and you bleed. You put that down, you bleed. Uh, in fact, the insurance company that I have my hospitalization with paid a, a, a dear widow just a few days ago $42,000. Uh, her husband got shot through the leg uh, while he was deer hunting and bled to death uh, before they got out of the woods. Uh, but anyhow, I got the United States Army and I found an old boy. He was a Christian scientist. Uh, I soon found out he wasn't either one of us. He wasn't no Christian and he wasn't no scientist. He wasn't either one of us. And he said uh, that if you hurt, you think you hurt. Uh, he said it's all in your head. That's all it is. Uh, well, one day I had the toothache. Uh, he said it's all in your head. Made me about half mad. I said, you ever hear the toothache anywhere else? Uh, who ever heard the toothache in my ankle? Who ever heard the toothache in the heel? Uh, and this guy said it was all in the way that you think. Well, in those two years that I spent in the United States Army, I had to take a bath a few times. Uh, and one day I went to take a shower. And when I got out, this Christian scientist was taking a shower. And I had to go through his to get into mine. If you know Army style, you got just a big bunch of showers, and you go pick out one. And when I went through this fellow's shower, he had the cold water on. I said, turn it off! Oh, he said, it's all in your head. He said, if you think it's hot, it's hot. If you think it's cold, it's cold. He said, if you think it's lukewarm, it's lukewarm. I said, you turn that cold water off and turn that other faucet on. you find out whether it's in your head or not. Bless God, that hot water hit his hide. He'd have found out whether it's in his head, amen? Listen, I'm an old country boy. I kill hogs about every year. In fact, this is the first year that I've killed hogs in a minute of time. But after a hog's dead, I put him in hot water and every hair on him comes off. Uh, is that right? Hot water makes hair come off. Hey, man. Next time, you find one of these Christian scientists uh, that says it's all in your head. He doesn't believe in pain. You take him with his back turned. Get you a good straight pen and tell it down what he believes. Hey, man. Now, let me tell you something, bud. I want to tell you right now, they didn't tell him to join the Christian scientists. Uh, they didn't tell him to join up with the gooses, the mooses, the hoot owls, uh, the pole cats, or nothing else. Uh, they didn't tell him to join the odd fellas. Uh, one man said to me the other day, he said, I'm an odd fella. I said, I'll agree with you. You're just about as odd as I ever made. That's all I'll tell you, friends. Uh, that's got, there's a lot of folks that's joined up. Uh, that I'm a kind of a large hall. Uh, I want to tell you something. Any time, there's got to get curtains over the windows uh, and a sergeant arms at the door. You gotta watch that out there. Yeah. Yeah. I told a large home fellow the other day, I said, look, me and you brothers in the Lord, if that thing's so good, Julian, what you tell me about? I said, if you go down there, join up with that thing, and you let you down there. You don't believe in Jesus Christ, the only God, the Son of God, and you and him's got some secrets, <laughs> and me, your brother, and the Lord, you wouldn't tell me about it? Shame on you. Come on, look now. I went to a funeral the other day, bless God, I never seen such a thing in my life. If I'd come in here looking like that crowd looked, y'all would laugh yourself half to death. I went to that funeral here these fellas were, and I want to tell you one thing, brother, listen. They had their little apron on and, and a little hat sitting on their head. And they all come appraised in that with their little aprons on. And uh, listen, friend. I would tell him to draw no large hall and go out seeking light and see what Jubilo and Jubilo and Jubilo thought about it. But God, I want to tell you, my friends, thank God. One, listen, one fellow told me the other day, he said, you ought to join the Masons go through the York, right? And said, you can see Jesus. Uh, I said, I'm ahead of you. I went for Calvary. Uh, amen. Thank God. They said, I have to join up for some large hall and take a note that I'll have my tongue pulled out, my ankles cast out, uh, and my body, uh, my Friends afflicted in some way. I got my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost of God. And the Bible said, glorify God. Everybody in the spirit which are healed. All right. Now listen, they didn't tell you what they say. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Boy, I want to tell you, when they said that, there's a transaction took place between heaven and earth, and that fella never did get over. Bless God. I think when we get to glory one of these mornings, we're going to see why he got his prison door open. I mean, you talk about getting set free. 
He heard something he'd never heard before. I mean, friends, he came to Calvary. He came to God's Son. He got born again by the marvelous grace of God Almighty. And that's always what happens when Jesus comes around. Amen? Look over there in the book of Mark chapter 1 and begin in verse 40. Oh, that's a thrilling story told of a man that had leprosy. He tried everything in the world. He'd gone to all the quack doctors. He tried everything. He tried this and he tried that. Tried all their medicine and everything. But the Bible said one day, thank God, he came to Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah! I want to tell you when he came to Jesus, he got his prison doors open came to Jesus to touch the heart of God. And I want to tell you, friend, there's never been a sinner that ever came to God. It didn't, it didn't move the heart of God Almighty. It touches God's heart for sinners to come. Yes, yes it does. Some years ago, Dr. J.C. could not told this story. It's been a blessing to my heart down through the years. He told how that there's a fellow came to a Fruitland Bible Institute that was much older than the rest of the, the preacher boys that was there. And he said, this fellow... Came up one day and he said, Brother, can I? I've been praying about it. God, won't you come out and run a meeting in our church? I really believe he does. And he said, would you pray about it? Brother, come out and said, I will. Said, you prayed about it? God said, go out there and preach a few days. So he went out. He said the first night that he went to that home to stay all night, heard an unusual noise from one of the back bedrooms. And the little preacher's wife looked at the fist and the evangelist and said, now you'll be staying here all week. And you'll be wondering what that racket is, what that noise is. Said, come here, I want to show you. She led him there to the bedroom, and there in a little baby bed was a child, just about this long. And, oh, listen, oh, brother, can I, said that mother, uh, said, preacher, can I, said, this is my oldest child. He said he looked in that bed, there was a boy, 18 years old, that had never grown much longer than that. His little head was pulled back to his spine. He was blind, deaf, and mute. And old brother Tanak said that that little feather's fingernails had grown out and it looked like claws on an animal's body. And he said the only racket in that noise that he was making was some kind of racket he could make with his vocal cords. And it sounded like an animal making some racket out in the woods somewhere. And he said that precious mother reached over, touched that little old feller, and the minute her hands touched him, listen, he came alive. Well, he began to try to smile. He went to clawing at the air with those fingernails that looked like claws. You see, those hands had always been his friend. When he was hungry, those hands were there to feed him. When his little body was dirty, those hands were there to wash him and change his clothes. When he was sick and his little body was fevered in the wee hours of the morning, bless God, those hands were there to take care of him. All the time for 18 years, he depended upon those hands. And those hands was always there. He said, that precious little mother, oh, that little deformed, that little blind, that little deaf and mute child of herself. And he said, with tears running down her face, she said, Brother Kanat, this is my oldest child, and I love him with all of my heart. Oh, when that preacher said that, I saw something. I saw something. I saw myself one day, wretched, deformed, blind, deaf, to the things that God Almighty, by the day of Jesus, reached down, glory to God, did he touch me? The same way he did that old leper. That's how he touched him, by God. And the minute he did so, I'll tell you something happened. Brother, those hands had always been my friend. And I'll tell you, he'd always hit me. Yes, he had. And Jesus pulled me up to himself and said, Father, this is old Billy Kelly. He's done things he shouldn't have done, said things he shouldn't have said, acted ways he shouldn't have acted. Gone places you shouldn't have gone. But Father, I love him. And for all that he's done, charge it to my account. Thanks, God, this a friend. I want to tell you one thing tonight. Thank God, when Jesus comes, he opens the prison bars. I drove, I was tired. You tell me, look at my red head. You wouldn't want somebody fooling me too long. Amen. When the fellas tired and give out, I drove all the way from the state of Florida. I got up in Kentucky, Williamsburg, Kentucky, started the meeting that morning. I got there about four o'clock. I was very exhausted, pulled up the churchyard. Didn't know where the preacher lived or anything. We hours the morning like that, you wouldn't want to wake anybody. So I tried to get a little rest from the car, laid down in the seat. And, and after a while, I woke up and, and it was daylight and I found where the preacher lived. And he said to me, he said, look, 
He said, we'll eat dinner today with one of the meanest men in this country. And said, he's a coal miner. They don't have any children. Said, he's bitter about that. And said, also, said, he's one of the meanest men in this country. But he said, if you feel impressed to God to talk to him, said, I'd sure appreciate it. But I'm going to tell you, he said, he's cussed every preacher out that's ever talked to him about God. I thought, now, what did he call me to talk to him about for? Amen. Here, I am tired, give out, and want me to go down there and get cussed out. He just, I thought to myself, now, that preacher just wants to hear me get a good cuss. That's what he wants. So I made up my mind. I'd go to that fellow's house and eat his rations and get out of there as quick as I could. That's just what I decided I'd do. So we went down to the house, and he didn't seem happy as me as that preacher said. He's about size man, this brother sitting right here. And, and, and uh, I just didn't think he was all that mean. I reckon he was, but he just didn't look that mean to me. We went in there and sat down. He got telling a few jokes. We talked a while, and he seemed like a pretty likable old boy. After a while, his wife called us to the table. Boy, they had a piece of steak on my plate, looked as big as that Bible. Was I ever glad to see that? <laughs> I've been eating a lot of deer meat, uh, deer old bologna and fat back and what have you, and I was glad to see uh, that nice piece of steak. So, I'll tell you, we gave God thanks for it. I cut me a piece of that steak and put in that side. I got me another piece and put over on that side, and then I cut me another piece and put straight in the middle. In case one of those sides ran out, I have a ready supply. Hey, <laughs> man. Well, this fellow started telling a joke. I thought to myself, oh boy, you just talk all you want to. You're not going to bother me a bit. I'm going to sit over here, and every now and then I'll say, hmm. And uh, that's all I'll do. And I'll eat this steak. And I'll have myself a big time. So he's telling this joke about halfway through that joke God said to me. He said, you tell that feller that my son died on Calvary for him. I said, Lord, I say, got my mouth full of food. And Ma told me to pop food in my mouth. <laughs> God said, time. I said, Lord, I can't. I said, uh, I, <clears throat> it's rude to interrupt somebody while they're talking. God said, tell it. Boy, listen, now just imagine, here this fellow is, right in the middle of his joke, me and my mouth full of food. I lull that steak around a time or two and down it well. I looked across the table and I called his name. Cecil Early was his name. I said, Cecil, did you know Jesus Christ died for you on Calvary's cross? Uh, now just imagine this man in the middle of his joke. Boy, he pushed back from the table, his countenance changed, uh, and I saw what they was talking about then, brother. I'm going to tell you, bless God, his face got as red as a turkey gobbler snout, the veins popped out his neck. It looked like sweat jumped out on his brow. His lips turned blue. His Adam Jaffa run up and down looked like 90 miles an hour. And he looked across the table. His old lips went to quiver. And tears started down his face. And he said, I know it, preacher, and I want to send it right now. I said, get out of here. It's gone. At that time, a big gush of wind blew the door open. And the telephone started ringing. Let me tell you, soul winners tonight, you know what I'm talking about, especially if you go out and win souls for God, a young that wouldn't cry if you used to stick them with a straight pin or have a temper tantrum when you get around trying to win somebody to God. I mean, a dog that wouldn't bark on a moonlight night will have a running fit when you're trying to win somebody to God. I told that man's wife, I said, you take the telephone off of the hook. I said, you shut every door, close every window. And I said, I mean to get this man saved. Well, I got him on his knees, and, and I said, I'll see, so I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you some scripture here. I'm going to show you how to be saved. Then I said, I'm going to pray. And I said, when I get through praying, I said, I want you to tell God you're a sinner. Tell you sorry for your sins. Uh, confess them to him. Ask him to forgive you for them. Amen. And I said, the Bible says, with the, uh, with the mouth, confession is made uh, unto salvation. So I took off a prayer. I got through, and I said, I see, so go ahead. Tell God you a sinner. And ask him to save you. He looked up as the hot talk tears was running down, and he said, preach ah! Said he's already. Ha ha! Boy, when he said that, bless God, brother called you. I forgot about that door being shut. And I like to run through the thing. By God, it's shot time when somebody gets saved by the grace of God Almighty. Yeah. You want to put me on cloud nine? You let some mother's boy, brother Mays, uh, make their way to an old fashioned order and bow before God and say, God, I'm a sinner. Save me for Jesus' sake. Glory to God, it turns me upside down. I mean, wheels inside of wheels go to turn it when somebody wants to get born again. I was at the Greenville Rescue Mission, Greenville, South Carolina. There's a man sitting on the back seat. The place was packed. Oh, it was packed. They had little kids sitting down on the altar, just crammed up. I stood up in a little hole all around it was with people trying to get a place to sit. And there's a judge, the city judge, is sitting behind me. 
I forgot about him. I got wound up a preach and I reached back like that and slapped and like to knock that judge's brains out. Well, I got by that, but it helped. The place was packed. When I gave the invitation that night, I saw a man that had been wiping his face, not with a handkerchief, but with an old rag. He jumped in, looked like two rows of seats. He hit the aisle, and here he comes. He came down on the big high platform, and there's a young boy from Bob Jones University laid almost on his stomach to talk to the man and on the, uh, from the big high platform. And as he leaned over and laid down almost to talk to him, he told that boy, he said tonight, he said, I want to be saved. He said, I want to save Jesus my precious old mother has. My mother's been praying 37 years for me. And said, I want to know that same Jesus. Uh, boy, listen, I'll tell you, after a while, I heard him cry out, God, I'm a sinner. Save me for Jesus' sake. And he gloriously got born again. And he turned to that young worker and he said, you know, tonight, he said, God's answered my mother's prayers. 37 years, Mama has been praying for me. Boy, it impressed that young worker. He got up, he said to Brother Tom Kirk, the director of the mission, he said, God answered that for his mother's prayer. said, he got saved. Mama's been praying 37 years for him. Boy, that impressed Brother Kirk. He went on, he said, that fellow, is your mother living? Yes, sir. Where does she live? Gainesville, Georgia. Does she have a telephone? Oh, yeah. He gave the number. Oh, Brother Kirk said, uh, working in the office right next to the auditorium. Put in a long distance phone call. He said, get Miss Brock on the line. I want to talk to her. Well, everybody was eavesdropping and enlisted. A little bit, that worker came out and said, Miss Brock's on the line. We heard old Brother Kirk say, hello, Miss Brock. This is Tom Kirk the director of the Greenville Rescue Mission in Greenville, South Carolina. I just wanted to call you and tell you that your boy got saved tonight. Boy, when he said that, that old mother shouted on the other end of the line. She said, praise God, the Lord always hears and answers prayer. And she threw that telephone down. And old brother Kirk said, you can hear her going through the house, uh, uh, slamming doors. Uh, and every now and then she passed that telephone uh, like the early morning special of uh, going through town, a uh, hollering glory. Amen. Hallelujah. After a bit, she got slowed down enough to get hold of the telephone. And we heard that boy say, it's true, Mom. He said, it's true. Tonight, he said, I trusted Christ as my Savior and said, I received him and he saved my soul tonight. But when he said that, Mama went into orbit again. She was a shot. You said, what are you shot about? It's time when somebody gets the present of oh, well, thank God, and gets saved by the grace of God Almighty. Bless God, this you don't do nothing for me. That's what's wrong. You need rewinding. From his dead head. One woman said to me the other day, I don't see nothing to smile about. I said, now look at you, I don't either. Some people never get happy about nothing. That's God makes me happy when somebody gets saved by the grace of God Almighty. That's right. Thrills my heart. Puts me on cloud nine. And my friends, God loves sinners. Now, you know, at Hatches Baptist Church in West Tennessee, our morning services, revival meetings, about 10 o'clock. Most all the people's country working folks and they get up early in the morning, go to the fields and work, come out to that church for the for, for services, have a little testimony, meet a little prayer meeting. At about 10.30, the evangelist would bring the message. On this particular morning, had the prayer meeting, testimony meeting. Now it's time for the evangelist to bring the message. About that time, there's an old mother, God bless her heart. Her hair was snow white, stood up and said, Preacher, you're going to have to pardon me. She said, I've got a baby boy it's lost on his road to hell. I'll tell you, my boy's 47 years old, preacher. I can't take it no longer. I've got to pray for my boy. That old mother moved out, started down, and got down all of that, and began to pray, oh, God, save my boy. Lord, save my boy. She said, God, I will stay this older till my boy gets saved. Are they sweet my bones out of this church house? Who you ever prayed like that for somebody? Mother, you ever prayed for a wavered child like that? For a drunken husband, you ever call on God to save a neighbor like that? God, I'm gonna stay here till they get saved. Or they sweep my bones out of the church. They stayed till about twelve o'clock. The pastor said to the evangelist, "What are we gonna do?" The evangelist said, "We'll die with us. That's what it takes." Amen. We'll get him saved. About one o'clock, most all the people, country folks, done left. There's only about ten or twelve left, maybe fifteen at the most. Some of them get down and pray a little while and get up and shout a while. But not old granny. God, I mean that I'm going to stay here till my boy gets saved. Or they sweep my bones out of this church house. Oh, listen, two o'clock, she's still crying to God. 
three o'clock. Oh, God, I mean it. I mean it, Jesus. I'm going to stay here till my baby boy gets saved. Oh, they sweep my bones out of this church. Uh, four o'clock, sometime after four, listen to this. Uh, all of a sudden, an old church door swung open. There's an old boy with an old dirty pile of holes on, an old blue work shirt. He had an old work hat in his head, and he was a hollering. You could have heard him for a mile. God Almighty, you get thrilled about it. See Jesus open the prison bars. Look at him in the Word of God. When they went up there to Jacob's well, get a drink. There's a woman came up, she was a Samaritan. He said, I'd like a drink. <laughs> she said, What are you talking to me? Aren't you a Jew? I'm a Samaritan. I'm nothing but a dog in your sight. Jesus said, If you knew who was talking to you, you'd ask me for a drink. Well, that sounds like double talk, doesn't it? Just got through asking her for a drink, and now that he tells her if you knew who he's talking to, you'd ask me for one to start with. She looked at him, you know what she said? She said, the well's deep, and you don't have a bucket. <laughs> but bless God, he didn't need no bucket. <laughs> Amen. Here's the well, by God. He said, if you drink of this water that I am, you will never thirst again. Oh, that woman saw something she'd never seen before. She took off the town and she said, I want you to come see a man that told me all things. And the Bible said a multitude became believers because of that woman's testimony. You mean God loves sinners? You mean God opens prison doors? Watch this one. Here's a woman taking the very act of adultery. They're going to stone her to death. I mean, they're going to fix her up. They're going to kill her. Jesus looked at him and said, you without sin... You go ahead and throw the first stone. They want one little pebble thrown. Not one. You know why? They're probably as crooked as she was. That's the reason why. You're welcome. They used to turn folks out of church. They don't do that in the morning either. They can't get up enough to run the rest of them all. <laughs> How'd you like that, huh? Come on, brother. Hey! Yeah! Say, do that sin. You catch the first stone. What a one can throw a rock. Jesus began to write in the sand with his finger. This three times in the Bible when God wrote with his finger. The first time he wrote with his finger was on a stone on top of Mount Sinai. That was law. The next time you read about God writing with his finger was at Belshazzar's party. There appeared the hand of a man. God began to write on the plaster above the candlesticks on the wall. That's judgment. But the last time you ever read about God writing with his finger, he was writing in the sand. I used to wonder what he's writing. Watch the place. And those on your face. He just told a girl her sins are forgiven. He is writing amazing grace. He <laughs> just writing amazing grace. Thank God. And he looked at that girl and said, Your sins are forgiven. I can see that poor girl. She walks down the trail with a skip in her heel. Thank God. And a smile on her face. What happened? A transaction between heaven and earth had just opened. Her prison bars. God loves sinners. God cares for sinners. Yes. God opens the sinners' prison bars. Yes. And sure as you say, you say, preacher, I've never had that happen to me. That's the reason I'm bringing you the good news tonight. God loves sinners. He doesn't love sin, but he loves sinners. Huh? God doesn't care one thing about your old crooked, nasty, filthy, low down sin, but God loves sinners. Yes, he does. I was preaching at the famous Pacific Park Mission in Chicago, Illinois. And we got down that morning about 6 o'clock. We had to get up at, uh, at 3 o'clock to get downtown. I mean, we was already in town. And I had to get up early to get downtown. I never, well, that's the biggest place I've been in my life. And uh, we got down there at that famous Pacific Park Mission. I thought there would be a handful there at 6 o'clock in the morning. Who in the world is going to be in a, in a place like that at 6 o'clock? Did you know what? We almost had to get a policeman to get us in. I never seen such a crowd in my life. But those crowds are up and outs, down and outs. Everything you could think of, every kind of a sinner you could think of was gathered out that morning. And we, they escorted us in there. And when we got on the platform, I looked over there and said, Oh, Billy Sunday's grand piano that they used in his big campaign. Not a soul left playing. Isn't that pitiful? Yeah. Isn't that pitiful? 
no musician to play that wonderful instrument. And there's all those sinners sitting there. Well, I'm going to tell you something. These old big aristocratic churches and all this crowd that was so interested in their numbers on Sunday morning. Why didn't they have a number down there hitting out, bless God? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Amen? I mean, that's where, where the hardcore sinners are, my friend. Yes, sir. Nobody to play that musical instrument. There's a big old thick tongued German got up that was over yonder in Germany when Adolf Hitler was in power. And he got up, he never told them who I was, or where I was from. You know what he said? In his broken English, he's going to preach to you. That's all he said. Nobody sung a song. Nobody prayed a prayer. He didn't tell them who I was. And said he's going to preach to you. Well, I got up, and boy, I, I wasn't really ready to preach. I mean, I thought they ought to have some kind of little preliminary there. And, and I wasn't really ready to preach. And in desperation, in desperation, I turned to my preacher friend. I said, how about leading us to the song? He said, I can't say, I can't say, I can't Boy, I would have done a dog that way. And here it is, Monday morning, to me, it's a horse I couldn't hardly talk. Of course, I think a preacher that's not horse on Monday, they ought to fire me to hell. Oh. That's right. Bless God, I got I could hardly talk, and that fellow told me he couldn't sing. I thought, well, boy, I'm going to preach. So I took the text and started. I could hardly talk. And all the time I was trying to get cranked up, I was begging God down in the recesses of my soul to help me somehow. I said, Lord, this thing happens here this morning. You'll have to do it. And after a while, boy, God opened my throat up. I, I'll tell you what the truth is. It looked like there's eight or nine hundred people packed in that place. And way back there was a room all of itself. And they had the worst drunks back there. I mean, fellas are drunk. And they could come into the service. They had them in a separate room. And I tell you, God got on me. And I got a and boy, after a while, I came down to the end of the message. Uh, boy, I wound up, Brother May. Like you did. Yeah. And I said, now nah, that. I was the song leader to come. The musicians to come. They don't know did how long you did. They don't know you did how long you song leader. I'm desperate now. I said to my preacher friend, would you come lead us to the song? He said, man, I can't sing. I can't sing. I said, let's stand. Everybody stand. We're going to sing Amazing Grace. I thought, everybody, Amazing Grace, saints and sinners alike. Amazing. They want nobody singing but me. I saw that crowd looking at me. Well, I said, you don't know the words? Well, let's just hum. Amazing grace. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, nobody hum it but me. Devil said, you're the biggest fool I've ever seen in my life. He said, no wonder you look like you look. It just fits the part. <laughs> he said, you're the goofiest goof I've ever seen. But I got the feeling, I'll tell you what's true. I want to quit. I just want to throw the towel in and quit them. That's just about the way I felt. And then God said, son, you preach the truth and give this plea. And I said, fellas, Men and women, I said, you don't know the song, Amazing Grace. You don't even know Amazing Grace. You don't know the author of Amazing Grace. I said, it wasn't John Newton. That's not the author of it. That's God, God's the author of Amazing Grace. I said, this one on tell you, if you don't get nothing else, God loves sinners. And if you'd like to go to heaven and get saved before you die, I said, would you, would you come on right now? Boy, I'm a telling you the aisles flooded. Bless God, here come eight in one drove. An old colored boy was leading the whole crowd. I jumped down there in my Bible, and I think I, 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 I could tell the way he talked to you, the southerner. I said, where are you from? He said, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And boy, he went to whip and he said, I want to know the same Jesus my old man who knows down yonder in Hattiesburg. Boy, he got to crying, and, and boy, I tell you, I heard such a confession. Praise God, I tell you, folks began to get saved. They made a profession of faith all over that place. Now, here's what I was saying. God opened the prison bars. You say, does God still do that? He's in that business tonight. I don't care how hard they are or where they come from. And where people call on God, yes. God opened the prison bars. Father, take these few scattered words tonight, use them for thy glory. Amen. Encourage every saint of God here tonight. Yes. Thank God one of these mornings, we're going to see you face to face. Oh, yeah. Bless every child of God tonight to know that it's worth it all to live for Christ. Thank you for what you've done already in Jesus' name. Amen.